Now, once Russia invaded Ukraine, the key port city of Mariupol in the south was besieged. A team from the Associated Press was the only international reporters to remain in the city. What they captured made headlines around the world, exposing the atrocities that were being committed by Russian forces there. Mrs. Chernov was the photographer on that team, and he's documented the harrowing experience in a new film, 20 Days in Mariupol. Here's a clip from the trailer. Russians have entered the city. The war has begun, and we have to tell its story. That was more than a year ago, and the pain and the horror of this Ukrainian story is nowhere near over. And Mr. Slav Chernov is now joining Hari Srinivasan to discuss the siege of Mariupol and its aftermath. Mr. Slav Chernov, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, your film, 20 Days in Mariupol, documents what happens when the Russians invaded. First, for people who might not know, why is Mariupol so significant? Well, starting from 2014, Russia have tried to occupy Mariupol uh, in the very beginning of Russia's invasion to Ukraine. It is uh, a port city, a huge port city with a huge industrial... It was, unfortunately, because it now is destroyed with a huge industrial infrastructure. And tactically, it's important because it is directly on the way from Russia to occupied Crimea. So from the point of logistics, from a, a symbolic point of view, this is probably one of the most important cities in Ukraine for Russia to try to occupy. You were there in the very beginning. We're talking back in February of 2022. And you capture a lot of the anxiety of the people there. Um, describe what they were going through, knowing that this is an important city that Russia will want, and they're coming. I think in the beginning, there was a lot of hope, and among us as journalists, too, there was a lot of hope that, that um, even if there will be a siege, it will be not so destructive. So it just caught us all uh, by surprise that Russians didn't even try to, to be careful. It was just an indiscriminate barrage of of all kinds of bombs and and weapons and uh, as soon as as soon as the Russian forces understood that they can't take uh, Mariupol easily, that the Ukrainian forces will be fighting for every single inch of their land, um, Russia just started to uh, destroy every building that was on the way. So as soon as the siege uh, went to its full mode. Uh, the power lines were cut off. There was no water, uh, food no food supplies. So therefore, looting has started, and it was just pure chaos. We uh, it was very hard to to operate for the city uh, workers. Imagine a city which is constantly getting bombarded, but doesn't have even a phone line to call the ambulance. Therefore, if you are injured, you die. It was horrible. And the worst thing, there was no connection between people. So the society just collapsed. And that was a deliberate tactics. And we as journalists were, you know, in the middle of all this. You made an active decision in making and crafting the film to center it around civilians. And there are so many gripping scenes in there. There was a scene where you start following a woman from a maternity hospital. What was that like? We were hiding from this airplane that was bombing the area in a building which was nearby. And we saw that the hospital was bombed bombed uh, a bit later after the mobbing happened we went up up the building and saw the um, the fire in the hospital so we ran there as fast as we could because we knew it's a hospital and 
the scene that we arrived there was shocking. Most of the people were already evacuated, but there were still a lot of pregnant women and um, rescue workers and everything was destroyed. And then uh, I saw rescue workers carrying this woman. Her name is Irina. She was 32 years old. She was pregnant and they were carrying her and she had this terrible wound on her pelvis. And there was like a silence, like deafening silence, like a ring in my ears, like after the bomb explodes, right? In the film, we really tried to to transfer audience there in that moment, and uh, this run towards the towards the ambulance was so it seemed so endless, so long. Although they had to run across just a a yard of a hospital, and then they just uh, they they loaded her in a in an ambulance and they left, and then. The day after, we were searching for her because we didn't knew we didn't know which hospital they carried her. We still were we still hoped that she would survive, but she uh, she didn't. The video that you took from that maternity hospital, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and leaders in the EU have thought about that and used that footage as possibly evidence of war crimes, and I wonder. Have you been contacted by any authorities to import that as evidence in any kind of an international tribunal? So there is there is a problem with the uh, war crime trials. Uh, the first one is that uh, to start to even start one, you need to uh, deoccupy the city. When Bucha was deoccupied, we saw the horrors that happened there, but the trials were possible exactly because. Uh, because they were buddies, there was physical evidence of of these crimes. With Mariupol, we know for sure that uh, the scale of the war crimes is maybe ten times bigger. I can't even imagine how much bigger the scale of the war crimes in Mariupol is. However, to even start speaking about this, we need uh, to see a city being deoccupied. And the problem here is that longer it stays under occupation. More of the more of the evidences are being destroyed. So these buildings that uh, that still have the remains of people who died in the shellings, they they just being knocked down and and turned into dust to pave roads. And uh, bodies are thrown into mass graves with just numbers, with the, well, basically numbers being erased after a while. Because there's like on these wooden, small wooden plaques, uh, all, all this is making investigations of war crimes very difficult. However, fortunately, we've been able to get most of the footage uh, out the original files, right? So, files with exifs, files with the um, with information in them, and that would make it uh, easier to identify. Uh, but yeah, a lot of a lot of evidence that was the evidence that were filmed by uh, residents were erased on the checkpoints when when people were trying to leave, and uh, their phones got just erased, uh, and uh, it's gone. You grew up in Kharkiv. Uh, what's it been like to watch images to go to places that you are familiar with that are now bombed out, torn apart? When I came back to Kharkiv after after Mariupol, uh, it was heavily bombarded, and uh, I was just going and trying to film again the victims of this of these bombardments. And one day I got a, a call from the rescue workers with just an address. So I drove there very quickly, not thinking what exactly that you know what was that address. And then I arrived, I realized that that's. That's a building where I, I I lived for five years when I was a student, and there were several, there were three dead people just in front of a of a of a house where I I used to you know spend so much time, and it was like coming, it's like coming, it's like it was like a nightmare you kind of wake up from. How do you function? I guess emotionally, physically, psychologically, when you're seeing these things. 
that are kind of unspeakable. I mean, you wrote uh, for the AP that I had seen so much death that I was filming almost without taking it in. What does that mean? Uh, well, when when you are in the scene, when, when there is a lot of adrenaline uh, pumping up, when there is the thought that you also need to survive uh, and you to, need to do everything quickly, and the only fear you have is to be sure that you need to capture every moment of, of what is unfolding in front of you. So you don't analyze emotionally what is happening. When it hits harder is when you are actually editing. And for almost uh, six months, or well, actually for almost a year, we edited the film. So every single tear, every single drop of blood I remember very clearly. I just can't escape from that. And it's just something you have to live with. And I guess all Ukrainians and all international journalists who work now in Ukraine, they all go through a similar experience. And what I'm always trying to say is that whatever the audience sees on the screen in this film is not something exclusive to what we live through. Uh, it is something that all journalists now are going through and all the civilians are going through in Ukraine. There were about 100,000 people, as you said, that were able to get out. But there yeah. were so many still left in Mariupol and they were struggling. They were desperate. You showed signs of looting. You showed them wondering who was doing the bombing. Why did you want to show that? the story would be incomplete without without these reactions because these reactions are are, are reactions to to the information blockade what is what is uh extraordinary sad about about the siege of mariupol that it was not only a, a physical military siege of the city it was an information siege an information siege that led to these consequences now we kind of see this um, it is a good example for a future. Well, it's a terrible example for a future, but it's uh, something that needs to be researched of, of how the society collapses and how people get confused and lost and, and, and susceptible to propaganda when their life in danger and when they have zero access to, to information. And that's also a note on importance of, of, of journalism in general. Um, in, in for our society. This is the first time I saw the, the Russian sign of war. The hospital is surrounded. Dozens of doctors, hundreds of patients, and us. Yes, <laughs> I have no illusions about what will happen to us if we are caught. Your team was likely the last reporting team left in there. You are essentially surrounded. You're inside a hospital and there's Russian tanks with large Zs on them. Explain what's happening. The day after the bombing of Mariupol, uh, maternity hospital, we were looking for survivors and we we're hoping that Irina, uh, who we saw on a stretcher, survived. And uh, we went back to hospital number two, which is a hospital where we spent a lot of time. Uh, and we found, we found out that she died and we found other survivors. One of them gave birth. That was like a ray of light in the middle of, of destruction and horrors. But as soon as we're trying to leave, we realize that the front line has moved and the battle is happening outside of a, outside of a hospital, sniper shot a nurse and we cannot get to our car and the Russian tanks started rolling around, uh, uh, around the hospital and shooting at the residential buildings. So kind of had a hard choice whether to keep filming 
being uh, in danger to be shot at uh, or um, hide somewhere. We, we filmed, but we obviously couldn't send anything from there. There was no connection. Yeah. And we would just went hiding because we knew that if Russians come in the hospital, they will capture us, they will see the cameras, they will capture us, and who knows what they're going to do with us, um, put us in front of the camera and say that everything we filmed was not true or they would just shoot us. Because, uh, well, now I know that uh, at the same time with us in Mariupol, Mantas Kudarevich, who's a Lithuanian filmmaker, was was filming as well. He wasn't sending anything, but he was in Mariupol. And while attempting to leave Mariupol uh, several days after we did, he was captured and uh, executed. So we know, like we knew that we shouldn't get captured and doctors dressed us in uh, uh, in overalls so we could pretend to be doctors in case Russians came in. but we were saved it was a miracle that we got out from from that hospital it was a miracle so this is just a snapshot of what happened in a particular city in just a particular set of weeks and here we are still in the headlines there are regular attacks that are happening there is an active shooting war did you think this would last this long? I hoped it wouldn't, but um, for me, it lasts already for nine years. It doesn't last for a year. It lasts for nine years. So, And all I've seen so far is escalation of this invasion. Russia invaded Crimea, it annexed it. Then it invaded Donbass, and... It was fighting, but then it was a peace treaty when Russia and Russia kind of swallowed that part, occupied that part of the territory. Now they are advancing and they are hoping for another peace treaty, which will allow them to to occupy even more territories. And then I know for sure that if that's the case, they will prepare... Uh, in a few years, there will be another attempt and it will be just endless. So as much as I want this to be over any minute right now, I realize that until, until and I get this from speaking to Ukrainians, uh, until um, most of the Ukrainian uh, recogni territories recognized by UN uh, are liberated, uh, there will be no peace. And there will be always danger of, of escalation of the invasion. The film is called 20 Days in Mariupol. Director Mstislav Chernov, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.